All right, why don't we open our Bibles to Genesis 34? Yes. If you haven't been here on a Wednesday night, just to kind of explain to you what we do, it's a little different than Sunday morning. Uh, Sunday morning is a little more, I'm speaking the whole time and there's not a lot of place for interaction. Uh, but here on Wednesday night, we're going through the book of Genesis. There's a lot to talk about and uh, really discovering God's plan of redemption throughout the family of Abraham. And that's really what we're reading about. And so I always start the beginning with questions about what we studied last week. So if you missed, you can kind of be brought up to speed. If you really want to catch up, most of these are all on YouTube, so you can catch previous uh, Wednesday nights, so you're not completely in the dark. But hopefully, I do a good job and bring you up to speed enough tonight so you can actually know what's going on, all right? So why don't we pray together, ask God's blessing on our study of His Word, and then we'll jump right in. So Father, we just come before You, and Lord, we want to come to You humbly, realizing that, Lord, we don't have the answers to all of life's questions, but you clearly do. And you've placed many of them, Lord, right in your word for us to read and know and understand. And I pray that we would understand what we read and study tonight. That all of it is meant to tell us about you and who you are and what you expect of us. And all of it is meant to point to Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you would point us to our Lord and Savior this evening. Help us to understand and apply what we read. And I pray for your help for me to do my part and just communicate what you have said clearly. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So by way of review, if you get this first question right, you're most of the way there. You've been here before. You're, you're ready to go. Who have we been talking about and focusing on recently in the book of Genesis? What family member have we come to? Jacob. All right, if you were going to say David, I was going to be really <laughs> upset. We talked about that last week, how we're dealing with 1 Samuel on Sunday, so that's King David right now, and Wednesdays is Jacob, and I got to admit, when I was studying tonight, all of a sudden I pictured myself in the context of David, and I got really messed up in what I was thinking and saying, so hopefully I don't do that again. But my first review question, raise your hand if you've got an idea, is what significant event in Jacob's life preceded his encounter with his brother Esau? Remember, this is about reconciliation. That was last week. What happened right before he sees Esau? Okay, and see, he wrestled with this mysterious person at night, in the dark, all night long until the rising of the sun we know, because we've studied it, that it was God himself, the pre-incarnate Christ, who Jacob wrestled with. And what was the outcome of that wrestling match? Who won? God always wins, right? Now, the whole context of last week and the whole point was reconciliation. Now, that is being shown to us in the picture of two twin brothers, Jacob and Esau, and how there was a separation of how many years were they not speaking nor seeing each other? 20 years. You all raise your hand, right? Okay, good. Just a second. So 20 years they had not spoken because Jacob was a bit of a scoundrel, as was Esau. Usually that's the way it goes when there's some severed relationship. It's not always one person is completely to blame, right? 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 Yeah, only two people answered at first. Because you're the right ones, right? All right, it's everybody else who's all wrong on the other side. But we see that Jacob and Esau had this severed relationship. It took 20 years for God to work in Jacob to where he could then be at a place where he could then reconcile with his brother. Now, I wonder how many of us, after hearing last week's message about reconciliation, did we go do something about it? Because we probably heard it. We probably like, yeah, you know what? That is right. But what good is it if we don't actually do it? Right? James talks about being hearers of the word only. 
He says, be careful. Don't be just hearers of the word only and not doers, but hear it and do it. That's what God expects of us. Because knowing it is not enough to benefit you and I or the people around us. So there's actually what the gospel in the New Testament calls the ministry, believe that, of reconciliation. And you know who heads up that ministry in the church? Jesus. He had a ministry of reconciliation. He's the one that Scripture prophesies about that He would turn the Father's hearts back to the sons and the sons' hearts back to the Father's. Has there ever been a division between fathers and sons before? Sometimes it seems that those are irreconcilable differences. But guess who can bring reconciliation where no one else can? Christ. And oftentimes we try to approach our relationships and the need for reconciliation in our own strength. And yet there is a deeper issue of a severed relationship that needs to be dealt with first. You see, what happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve was they were in unity with one another and with the Lord. And because of sin, there was a severing of that relationship. So then God the Father sends Christ the Son to then reconcile God and man through the one man who is fully man and fully God. And so Jesus' entire ministry is about reconciliation. Is it any wonder that we saw the ministry of reconciliation embodied in Jacob and Esau? We saw the two parts. We saw Jacob, a changed man, a changed heart, humbly asking for forgiveness. And we see Esau, believe it or not, portraying Christ in that situation where he lovingly shunned him and put his hand up and said, I don't want anything to do with you, right? No, Esau ran to his brother, fell on his neck and kissed him. And we saw that was the story Jesus took from in the Old Testament and told what parable? Parable of the prodigal son. When the son goes away, blows everything, loose living, destroys his life, and then his heart is turned back towards his father. And he's ready to eat humble pie and break down and just ask that he could live like one of the father's servants. And the father sees him, runs to him, falls on his neck and kisses him and welcomes him back home. It's shocking that Esau is a picture of Christ in that reconciliation because he was such a scoundrel. But that is the reconciliation we see between man and man and God and man. And so if you heard it last week and you have a relationship that maybe you haven't spoken for 20 years or more or less, what did we talk about last week? Inquiring of the Lord, praying and asking God, what would you have me to do in this situation? I encourage you because I'm not going to let you off the hook to hear it last week and not do it. I'm going to remind us again tonight. Being a Christian is being a part of the ministry of reconciliation. Being reconciled to God first, us to Him. Reconciling with others that we've wronged or they've wronged us. And then helping others reconcile to God and reconcile to one another. So that message last week was an important one. And it's one that we don't want to lose sight of. So I'm going to ask you next week if I remember. <laughs> Did you do what the Bible taught us to do. Okay, I'm, so we'll see. Second question, that was a long first question. In what ways had God changed Jacob through that wrestling match? There's three ways I can count of, Don. Okay, dislocated hip. Didn't tap. Should have tapped out. Changed his name? Anything else? Changes attitude or heart. Very good. Now, interesting about the changing of the name, little family story. We're driving back last night on the fast track lane 
and I've got the four boys in the car. We're coming back from Muay Thai kickboxing and jiu-jitsu class. And Landon, Shadow Blue, goes, hey, Dad, what, buddy? He goes, when I grow up, I'm going to change my name. <laughs> All right, what name are you going to change? He's like, the Wozniak one. I'm going to change that name. <laughs> oh, okay. And he goes, can I do that? No. <laughs> He's like, why not? I'm like, buddy, that would break my heart. He's like, well, why? And so then we had this discussion, and I said, buddy, I said, I gave you my name. He goes, that's your name? I'm like, yes, it's not just dad. <laughs> Philip Wozniak, that's my name. And, uh, and I had tried to call my younger brother earlier, and on my phone it says Brian Wozniak, and it was on the dashboard, and Luke goes, who's that? I'm all, Uncle Brian. He goes, he's a Wozniak? <laughs> I'm like, so clearly our kids' understanding of family name doesn't really make sense to them yet. But so Landon, I'm explaining to him, now all the boys are a part of this, right? They're all listening in, and I'm like, buddy, that would break my heart because I gave you that name. Mom and I gave you that name, and I have not given that name to any other kid but you five. And if you have my name, that makes you part of my family, right? And I said, the only people who have the authority to change your name is your parents or the Lord. I don't personally think we as individuals should have that right to change our names unless we're going to get into the marriage thing. The, the parent names the child. That's why when we adopted our kids, we felt it was important that we now, being mom and dad, now have the unique authority to change their name. When they were foster kids, we couldn't even cut their hair. Right? We didn't have the authority to do so. But when they became Wozniaks, you better believe we cut their hair, and we changed their names because we wanted them to have the names we gave them, right? And then I said, the only person in our family who can change that last name is Haven. And they're like, well, why? <laughs> okay, so I had to lay it out for them. When the woman, when Haven grows up and she finds a guy who loves the Lord and they get married, she's going to take his last name because it's a sign of her coming underneath his authority, not my authority as dad anymore, but under that man's authority, and she's going to make a family with him. She'll still be a part of our family, but she won't have the last name Wozniak anymore. She'll have that name. And they're like, okay. And Joey's like, well, didn't God change people's names in the Bible? I said, yes, son, he did. I said, Jacob, he changed to Israel. And Joey goes, oh yeah, and um, Paul, he was Saul and changed to Paul. I'm like, right. And he goes, and Abram. I'm like, man, I'm so proud right now. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, yes, Abraham. And so you see God the Father changed a name because of a transformation in the heart and the person's life, that they were no longer what that name meant anymore. They now had a new meaning and a new purpose. So all that to say, yes, God changed Jacob's name because he was a changed man now. He was doing what God had asked him to do. Um, how many years? We already answered that. Um, did Jacob know how his encounter with Esau would turn out? So when Esau's coming with 400 armed men, he's thinking, hmm, was I nice to my brother last time I saw him? I don't think so. And he's, this is an opportunity for faith now. Fear or faith, what was he going to walk in, right? And so Jacob took precautions in case everything went south that he had all his wives and children march forward in his order of preference. If you remember that, least favorite wife and children. And then next and lastly, Rachel and Joseph, the golden child, right? And who was in front though? Jacob was. Because he wanted, if anybody was going to get killed, he was going to be the one to defend his family first, which was a good thing Jacob did. Uh, did Jacob and Esau reconcile? Yes, we already touched on that. So, on their way back to the land of Canaan, remember, 20 years in Haran, God says to Jacob, go back to the land of your father and grandfather, the land of Canaan, that I promised to them, which is kind of present-day Israel. 
And so Jacob's still on his way back. He stopped in the city of Shechem, right? And settled there for a time. We're going to read what happens now. So why don't you go ahead and stand with me and we're going to read Genesis 34. By the way, there is one daughter mentioned in the lineage of Jacob. Who remembers the name of this daughter? Dinah, who knows what her name means? Uh, <laughs> I had to ask you one question you didn't know the answer to. It means female judge. It's interesting. So she's mentioned because a horrific evil happens to her that we're going to read about. And uh, this is not a good event, but it's one that we're going to see. It changes the course of Jacob's family quite a bit. So chapter 34 of Genesis Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter, Dina, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. And the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to me to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take your daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me I will give. Ask me for a great bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me, only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dina. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become as we are by every male among you become circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city saying, these men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. On the third day when they were there, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives and all that was in the houses they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? You can be seated. What do you think of that? It is heavy. That is, and yet it's true to life. It's a real account and a real event 
of how real people deal with a horrific situation. And not everything done here is good. There's a lot going on and there's a lot to look at. Let's look at this first section of Genesis 34. We're told that Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. Now, Leah had children. We went through the whole breakdown of uh, Leah, what Bilhah and Zilpah, the two servants, the kids they had with Jacob, and then Leah, her six sons and her one daughter, and then Rachel, her one son, Joseph, so far, but she'll have Benjamin later. Now, do you think Jacob and all his crazy family dynamics only had one daughter? It's possible, right? He could have had just 11 sons and then one daughter. Realistically, however, the Bible doesn't always mention all the daughters born to a man. And it's not so much a commentary on Scripture, but it's a commentary on the cultures of the day. All the family lines were traced through the male. And so they would list the father and then the male sons, and the women weren't necessarily included in the genealogy unless there was a significant event that happened that impacted the family in the future. So she is mentioned in the previous chapter because of what happens in this one. That's why we're told about her existence and that she's there. Now, some people would look at that and go, wow, the, the Bible's pretty messed up in its treatment of women, right? I mean, there's some messed up things that happen. Now, let's be historically honest. The world and cultures in general have been absolutely brutal to women from the beginning of time, right? And it wasn't until Christ that women were exalted to their rightful place as co-image bearers of God, representatives of Him in their rightful place. And so the women who were most despised in the culture of Jesus' day were the ones that He exalted to the rightful place. Who were the first witnesses to the resurrection? Women. Who were the first ones to say, Christ is risen to a bunch of men? Women. God honored them because I think Eve, because of the deception in the garden, caught a lot of flack, right? And her punishment was more severe than man's, even though man sinned as well and he was the leader. But she was punished for it, and yet because she was deceived, and through that all creation fell into sin and decay, Christ who comes to redeem all of creation, from death to life, is born of the Virgin Mary, a woman who brings Christ into the world, and the women are allowed to tell the good news of how Christ has redeemed everything, because it was with woman it all went awry, and it was through women the good news would be told to everybody to make it all right. God's pretty just in how He does that, isn't it? It's pretty amazing what He does. And so Christ is always lifting women up to the rightful position. And yet, this was an aspect of how sin had shaped culture of this day. And you see it embodied in this prince named Shechem. And there's been a lot of Shechems throughout human history, has there not? Who have been men of power, who had all kinds of access to please their earthly desires, and oftentimes they took what they wanted. And that's what we see in this man named Shechem. Uh, verse 2, when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her, lay with her, and humiliated her. Let's talk about Shechem for a mi minute because this whole story revolves around him and what he's done. Now, Shechem, we're told in this verse that he's the prince of the land. Now, if you go back to Genesis thirty-three eighteen. Can you tell me the name of the city where Jacob and his family had settled? Shechem. Is that coincidence? So it seems Hamor also has a favorite son. Jacob had Joseph. Hamor has Shechem. So much so it says that he's the favorite of all his household. 
literally the little prince in the land. He names the city where they live after his son, Shechem. And so what we can conclude from this is Shechem is the type of man who got whatever he wanted. He was not used to hearing the word no. And if he faced resistance, he took what he wanted. That is a pretty good expression of evil at work in sinful desires, don't you think? And so we see here that this is the type of man we're dealing with. Um, He's the son of Hamor. Now Shechem means shoulders. He was a very manly man with big shoulders. I don't know. Um, Maybe he was delivered breach and they had a hard time getting him out because of his shoulders. Who knows? But he was named Shoulders. So, you know, they came up with nicknames for their kids, apparently. Uh, But his dad had a better name. Hamor. Sounds strong, right? Means male donkey. (laughs) Your parents do not love you if they name you male donkey, right? And so that was his name. He was a male donkey. He was a stubborn, obstinate man. But we're told that Shechem saw Dina He seized her, he lay with her, and humiliated her. And I think the Hebrew word for humiliated is most accurate. It means to be afflicted. He afflicted her. He stooped down to her. It it means to subdue, to forcefully humble. All of that embodies what rape is in every way. The way this is described. This is the Bible's way of saying that he raped her. And that's exactly what happened in this situation. It says that in verse 3, his soul was drawn to Dina, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her, obviously trying to manipulate her, most likely, um, after the fact. The word drawn means to be stuck together, to be made to cleave to another thing. So his soul, because of that interaction, was cleaved or glued together to her. He couldn't let her go because he had overcome her and overpowered her and he wanted her. And so he would do anything to get her. It actually says that he loved her, but the Hebrew word for loved can mean many different things. It can be familial love. You love your son or your daughter um, parents. It can mean romantic love. It can mean covenantal love. Clearly it wasn't covenantal because there was no covenant. This was absolutely sin where he assaulted her, raped her, and she was blameless in what happened. And, But that word love would be more of a romantic or sexual love or attraction that he had for this young woman. But we don't know how old she was. Now think about what you know of cultures even in the Middle East today, unfortunately, but elsewhere where you have child brides, where you have 50-year-old men marrying 8-year-old girls. Okay, That still happens today. And we don't know how old she is. Shechem refers to her as a young woman in one verse, and he refers to her as a girl in another verse. Both of them are two different words that are used. Both of them can mean anywhere from an infant to a young adult. So it really doesn't help us. It's basically saying, you know, we could call somebody a girl who's 18 and a girl who's one. It's kind of that type of thing. But most likely he was older and she was younger is what we see in this picture, um, unfortunately. So we get on to verse 5. Jacob hears about it. How do you think Jacob heard about what happened? What, sweetheart? What was that? Yep, the Lord. And I think his daughter said something. And that's one thing that we've told all our kids, and sometimes when I meet with families and their kids, there's something we said, you have to create an environment where your kids understand, no matter how old they are, that if anything happens to them, that they are safe to tell you. If anybody's hurt them, wronged them, Because those type of acts of evil are perpetuated in our culture and our society because Satan's really good at bringing shame when it's not that person's fault, of bringing um, fear 
that something bad is going to happen, something worse is going to happen if they say something. And so if you have young ones or young people in your life and in your circle, make sure you raise them in an environment where they understand that they can come to you no matter what happens. No matter what. And for some, as I've met with many in adulthood, they carry that all their life and don't ever say anything until sometimes later on. And they're finally free, but look at how much time they spent being tormented by that, acti- that evil that was done. And Satan loves to keep those things secret. And so the best thing we can do is create an environment where they feel safe to actually say, this is what happened to me. Thankfully, Jacob, it seems, created that environment for his daughter. She said something. Now, Jacob heard that uh, Shechem had defiled his daughter, Dina, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. So Jacob is holding it together. There's a time to react, and there's a time to suck it up for the sake of your daughter and not react until it's more appropriate. And so Jacob composed himself. He held his peace. And he waited till all his sons were there because this was a family matter that they were going to address. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. How do you think this is going to go? The sons of Jacob had come in from the field and as soon as they heard of it, and the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. This is what the Bible has to say about it. For such a thing must not be done. Everything about this was wrong that Shechem did. Nothing is right nor acceptable. Verse 8, but Hamor spoke with them saying, so here's the father doing the son's bidding. Remember the father who gives his son everything? And even when his son horribly screws up, he's going to try to cover it up and bargain and make things right to make sure his son doesn't face the consequences for his actions. This is bad parenting 101. Do whatever you can to spare your child from the evil they've done and the, and the wrong that they intentionally did when there is no desire to change. Do we see any indication in Shechem that he's sorry for what he did? That he acknowledges that what he did was wrong and that he wasn't going to do it again? None whatsoever. So dad is just trying to, oh no, my son doesn't do anything wrong. You know, he loves your daughter. Dude, I would have killed him right then. Like, hopefully not, but. Yeah, I mean, that that is a possibility. Yeah, it is a possibility, but. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that just because there's no evidence to suggest it, but is that a possibility? Yeah. Um, do we form a doctrine about it and firmly say that? No, but it, it could be. Um, but he has shown care and concern for all his kids up until this point. He just has some favorites. <laughs> um, so it, it's very possible. Um, but here, Hamor brings the proposal The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. I don't know if Jacob's sons could have held their peace at this point. We're not told how they acted or what they did. Um, But he says, make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers. So now the perpetrator is speaking up he also said to the father and let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me i will give ask me for as great a bright price and gift as you will and i will give whatever you say to me only give me the young woman to be my wife they should have said over our dead body is what they should have said but let's talk about some significance here bigger picture jacob's going back to the land of canaan of god's promise He went to Haran in the first place because he wasn't supposed to marry one of the Moabite or Hittite women. He was supposed to go back to his family line and find a wife from there, right? What happens if Jacob and all his sons make a covenant with the Hivites 
who are not God's people in the covenant with God, marry with them, have children with them, and they become one people. Is that what God is wanting to happen? No. So you have Satan presenting a proposal. Great evil and wickedness was done. (coughs) And he comes in, instead of dealing, allowing the sin to be dealt with, and having Shechem killed for what he did to their daughter, instead, he's like, well, let's just come together. Let's be one happy family. Let's, we'll take your daughters and you give us ours. And his motives come up when he's talking to his sons about, hey guys, got a good deal. You know, you got to have a little procedure done. But you're going to get wives from them and look at all their wealth. Surely it's going to be all ours. The greed and evil keeps growing, right? So I see a very clear symbolic picture here of Jacob and his sons having an opportunity to be yoked together and united with a pagan, unbelieving people and culture that would cause the plan God had for them to disappear. The lineage of Abraham to disappear. The blessing through Abraham to never come. And how often do we have opportunity when events happen in our life sin has happened to then form a partnership and a covenant with someone or a group or the world itself in order confessing our sin and making it right, we cover it up to then make it justified. And you could think of a million different examples of how this can play out in somebody's life. But the Christian is always tempted for the light to be brought into the darkness to be swallowed up by it, to make a partnership with someone or a lifestyle or a way of living or a career or even a world system that is not what Christ wants for them and to make that partnership and lose the blessing that God has for them and the plan that He wants for them. There's a reason why the New Testament talks about the Christian being light in a dark world. And so here, Jacob and his sons have the opportunity to partner with an unbelieving covenant. And they seem to agree to it, but there's a little deception here. Verse 13, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father deceitfully. So we already know they're lying from the start, right? And they say, because you have, they deceived them because they defiled their sister. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to you who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Remember, the Abrahamic covenant is that every one of your males will be circumcised as a sign that you and all your people belong to me. You're different than the world. But in this agreement, they're going to become like them, but they're trying to get Hamor's family to become like them, right? Missionary dating. So they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. That would be a disgrace. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we'll give our daughters to you. We'll take your daughters for ourselves. We will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen, we're going to take our sister and leave. Okay. Next verse 18. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing. (laughs) What did he do? I can't imagine being excited about that procedure. (laughs) But apparently, he wanted this girl so bad, he's like, yep, guys, give me a minute. Goes off. Circumcises himself, apparently. Um, And it says, because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now, he was the most honored of all his father's house. So, say more... Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city, spoke to all the men, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land, trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give them our daughters. This is all good stuff so far, right? Then here comes the condition. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people, when every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate 
of his city, listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Now, that is an interesting circumstance. I don't know who in Jacob's family was the guy who had to check, but probably the youngest, the one who did not want the job that day, but making sure that everybody was altered, right? And so this is where it gets interesting. On the third day, when they were nice and sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords, came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. Is this strategically savvy? Sure is. Those guys don't want to move and do anything. When these two brothers came in with swords, they're probably like, finally, someone's just going to kill me, <laughs> right? They're probably in so much pain, like, kill me now. And then in they come, like, wow, God answers prayer really quick. <laughs> or they come in with a sword and they're like, no, no, I already did it. Don't do it again. <laughs> Either way, two sons are mentioned who are the hitmen. Why these two? They're Dina's brothers, right? Which, why is it significant, these two? Why do you think? Her full brothers. These two, Simeon and Levi, were sons of Leah, like Dina was. It was not a half-brother situation. This was their sister. And so these two, now remember, all the sons spoke deceitfully. So it sounds like these two were sent out, and then the rest then followed. Um, they killed Hamor, the son of Shechem, with the sword, took Dina out of Shechem's house, and went away. Notice, they allowed Dina to go with them. Right? That's a whole other part, how difficult that must have been to make this whole thing play out the way it did. They took her back. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain, plundered the city, because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys and whatever is in the city and the field, and all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, and all that was in their houses they captured and plundered. Now this is a picture of the future for everybody who walks in wickedness. That everything they seek to hoard for themselves, even that will be taken from them. Right? Their greed, their evil that they were acting in, they got what they deserved. Um, scripture does not necessarily approve of what Jacob's sons did. Jacob did not approve of what they did because Jacob confronts his sons in verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few. And if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Jacob did not argue with his sons at that point. So we have swift vengeance being delivered against these workers of evil. Uh, Jacob and his sons do not partner with Hamor, but wipe them out. And because of that, they move on to a new location and they settle where God had planned them to. So this whole situation altered the course of where Jacob's family settled and they ended up reaching their final destination where God wanted them. All that to say, that's a pretty crazy chapter, right? What are the takeaways? Takeaways are mankind has been evil from the beginning. And many people have been affected by the sin of others. And, and God sees that. And this is a picture of those who did evil facing justice very quickly. And there's an aspect of justice here I want to highlight. Is that every evil deed every human being has ever committed is treated with justice by God Almighty. It is dealt with and punished. You see, God has to punish evil for Him to be good. And I've used this example before. If you have a family member who was kidnapped, who was raped and murdered by an individual, and that person is captured by the authorities, and they go to stay on trial, 
and they appear before the judge. All the evidence is laid out, absolutely guilty in every way. The jury finds the person guilty, and the judge looks at them and goes, you know, I know you're guilty, but I'm feeling merciful today. You can go free. That was your family member that they did all those evil things to. How would you react? What would you conclude about that judge? Would they be a good judge? Then why do people think God is a good God if he looks at all the evil out there and goes, oh, no, I'm, I'm merciful. You can just, yeah, do whatever you want. Because our sin hurts other people and ourselves. So why would God be good if he just overlooked it all? So oh, I'm just going to act like it didn't happen. For him to be good, he actually has to punish evil. So how can God, who is just and has to be just to be good, how can he also love the person who perpetrated the evil and not wipe them out for all eternity? Well, he sent Jesus to be our substitute so that every evil deed you and I have done has been placed on Jesus and punished upon him. So God's justice is satisfied. So now, for all those who believe in Christ, their evil has been justly dealt with, with God's wrath. So now, it's not on us anymore. God's grace and blessing has been transferred to us. Our sin went on Christ. His blessing and righteousness came upon us. And now we can receive mercy, even though we're the one who deserves punishment. And that's where you get the two pieces of the cross, the vertical and the horizontal. You've got justice and you've got mercy. I'd say actually justice and mercy is what we have in Christ because every evil deed has to be punished for God to be good. But he planned a way where he could punish the evil and save the sinner. Isn't that an amazing good news that we hear? Amen. Let's pray. Let's sing our last song together. Father, we thank you for this rather interesting section of Scripture. But I'm so thankful for how all of it continues week in and week out, day in, day out, to point to Christ. And I pray, Lord, that whenever we read our Bibles, we would have eyes to see how it points us to Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we would leave here tonight, that we would take comfort in the justice you have given towards all the evil that's been done to us. Lord, any evil deed done to us, it may look like that person got away with it in this life. If they don't believe in Christ, your wrath will be poured out upon that person for the evil they did to us and others. And if they believe in Christ, however, that evil is still being punished for what was done to us but Jesus is the one who is punished in their place. Jesus, you've been punished in our place for the sins we've done to others. And I pray that we would be thankful for the mercy we have received and that we would love you and worship you more. I pray that anybody who has been wronged by another in any type of way, Lord, bring healing to that person tonight. Make them whole and redeemed in every way. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.